On this episode of Between Two Beers, we talk to Dr. Mark Fulcher. Fulch is a former New Zealand National League footballer who quite incredibly went to the Club World Cup with Auckland City in 2006 in the dual role of goalkeeper and doctor. After juggling medical studies alongside stints with Glenfield Rovers, Only Hunger Sport, Island Bay United, Tauranga City and North Shore, Fulch retired from football in 2014 to focus on his career. Fulch now runs the show in the New Zealand sports medicine community. He's a medical director at New Zealand Football and has worked as a team doctor for the All Whites and Football Ferns at World Cups and two Olympic Games. Fulch is on the FIFA Medical Committee, has worked at the ASB Tennis Tournaments in Auckland for Netball New Zealand and was a team doctor for the Silver Ferns. In this episode, we discuss what COVID-19 means for domestic football in New Zealand. We talk concussion, the challenges of being a 5'10 goalkeeper, his experiences playing with Ryan Thomas and being coached by Declan Edge and his fallout with Anthony Hudson. Ultimately, it's the work ethic, though, that led him to the top of his field. Steve, I really enjoyed this episode. Fulch is a top, top man. How did you think we went? Yeah, good. Good ep. Uh, Fulch is the real deal. Smart, witty, tells a great story and has got a lot of great stories to tell. Uh, enjoyable ep, um, particularly in the, the second half. It gets into some really interesting topics, so stick around. This episode was actually sponsored by Marcus Trail, a man who produced one of the worst tackles I've ever seen while playing for Melville United against Fencibles in 2001. Marcus also played for Waikato United, Narawahia and North Shore and is a top bloke. Cheers, Marcus. If you're interested in sponsoring an episode, contact us at the Between Two Beers Facebook page. Hope you enjoy. Dr. Mark Fulcher. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks very much for having me. Great to have you along. Uh, Fulch is a guest who we've wanted on here from the very start. I think we've, we might have requested him through private messages about four or five times, but an incredibly busy man, uh, doctor, so hard to get hold of. But now he's in isolation, so he didn't really have any excuses. So flicked him a link, 8.30, the kids are in bed. We've got them all to ourselves. Shay, why don't you get us started? How do you know Dr. Mark Fulcher? Um, well, I first watched him as a goalkeeper for Waikato FC in that inaugural um, inaugural season. And then I worked with him. Um, I think first tournament was in Samoa, women's under 20s. I think Doc came as the, um, the team physician for the under 20s to Samoa. And then uh, we went away to the Olympics together in 2012, had some All Whites tours, and then he's helped me out in a medical capacity over uh, over the years as well. Uh, uh, a man I think I, I consider as a very, very good friend. I, I think the same, Seamus. Uh, you'd be relieved to know. And, um, and he's one person that, that messages me back um, when I message him, unlike um, <laughs> with you, Stephen. <laughs> Are you asking me how I know Dr. Mark Fulcher? Well, do you? Because he's quite often blanked some of your messages. How do you know Dr. Um, Mark Fulcher? As has been documented uh, on the show, I've, I've had quite a terrible run with injuries over the years. And one of the people who's helped me in my rehab along the way is Dr. Mark Fulcher. Um, Roland, normally, Roland, when I worked closely with him at Glenfield, would say, go and see the doc. He'll help you out. So a few knees, a few backs, a few bits and pieces. But it, it, he was actually my port of call when I was at my lowest ebb. Um, as I said, through my dehabilitating back injury saga, um, one of the doctors I saw suggested I never run again, that my running days were over. Um, and I was quite distraught after that. So I gave a sort of an SOS to Dr. Mark Fulcher and said, Fulcher, I need a second opinion here. Um, and yeah, from memory, it might have taken a little while to get hold of him. Um, maybe I had the wrong number or he didn't recognize the, the name. Or I don't know what it, what it was, but he did help me in the end. I went up and saw him and yeah, it led me on a, on a path to basically saying, keep running because that other doctor is full of shit probably terrible advice um and yeah I, I don't know him that well but every time i've interacted with him i've had a great experience so looking forward to tonight shay where are we starting well hang on well, uh, I, I think i'd like to just make a little point there i, I uh shay, shay has uh, told me that you're a little bit affronted that i didn't get back to you uh, about your your i think <laughs> the word is debilitating um not de-rehabilitating or, or whatever it was you said but 
Um, I went through uh, my call history with Seamus in person, and uh, we were able to confirm that there was there was a total of one text message from you. Uh, is that right, Shay? I'm going to go into bat for Stephen here. There were, Ooh. I think, a, cu a couple of messages, <laughs> and I'm quite I'm quite happy to take the screenshot and actually post it on the, the page. But okay, well, look, that's, that's irrelevant. I think I think the crux the of Stephen, we'll move on. Yeah. we'll move on. Yeah. Well, I think I think the crux of of Stephen and probably my own is that in doing research for this podcast, it's been very difficult to get. I think. Dirt is probably a good way of <laughs> saying it on on Fulch. So many people hold you in high regard, Fulch. So many people have come back and said that you've helped them out, um, squeezed them in, helped got, got stuff doing. I think that speaks testament to your to your character. But one of the interesting things which we can start on is your claim to fame in the football world, which is being the shortest um, goalkeeper, I think, to be on a playing roster at a FIFA tournament. Yes, I have rolled that out. Um, I uh, I don't know. When I think about my footballing career, clearly I was a very short goalkeeper. Um, I think at, at best of 5'10 was probably my, my absolute PB. If I can see some eyes rolling there. But I yeah, think 5'10, <laughs> so 178 centimetres, that's me. Um, and, you know, ideally you'd be a bit taller than that being a goalkeeper. And... Uh, I don't know. It's a it's a nice banter. It's clearly not true. Um, there's a, a Mexican goalkeeper called Jorge Campos, who, in addition to playing in goal, he he was a striker as well. So he he was an actual proper player. He played in the the World Cup for Mexico. I think he played a hundred times. And then uh, just recently, the Under Twenty World Cup in New Zealand. I can't remember one of the African goalkeepers was ridiculously short. So it's uh, it's not true, but it's a good it's a good yarn and a good story to tell. <laughs> well, let's well, put you... some context around it because it was it was Club World Cup for Auckland City, and you were actually not only uh, listed as a player, but you were also the team physician. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, it's a vaguely ridiculous story. So, I uh, I kind of quit playing. I just I, I had enough for football when I was in my probably early thirties, maybe thirty two, thirty three, um, and then Auckland City qualified for the the first Club World Cup that that a New Zealand team had qualified for, and uh, I essentially got a call asking whether I'd be interested in being the player doctor. <laughs> and uh, it, just when I talk about it, it's, it's, well, it's a ridiculous situation. I've been the player doctor actually a few times. I don't know if you remember, um, I was on the bench before the London Olympics um, when we played the UAE. I was the reserve oh, goalkeeper that. then. Yeah, I signed a few work that day, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, what do you do? You say, the kids ask you for an autograph, you say, no, you look like a jerk, and you say yes, and you get paid out forever uh, by your mate. So um, but where was I with that? Yeah, so look, it was a, it was too good an opportunity to say no to, and um, <laughs> it's those are uh, my uh, one of the things I remember about that trip, other than... Um, just feeling like a, a professional player for a few weeks was I, I got an interview request. My nationality at that time was Scottish. Um, I grew up in Scotland and, and moved to New Zealand when I was about 10. And uh, I got interviewed, me and Brian Little got interviewed for the Scotsman. And a, a throwaway comment was, uh, I wonder if Barcelona has a player doctor. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> and I, I thought, literally thought nothing further of it. I just sort of never been interviewed before by a, a proper journalist, and uh, I just thought it was nothing. And then my granny, who's in Scotland, uh, is reading reading the the paper in front of the fire, and there's a picture of me and Brian Little, and a, a headline something to the effect of uh, "Wonder if Barcelona's going to play a doctor." So it was just it was a, a great opportunity, a great experience, vaguely ridiculous, and. Uh, Unfor yeah, what <laughs> I've just forgotten briefly the the, the second goalkeeper got injured Richie basically Lisby. getting off the plane. Yeah, Richie got injured basically getting off the plane, and so I spent the entire tour living in fear of actually having to play, <laughs> 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 having trained like once once in the six months leading up to the tour. That was going to be my next question. Were you more valuable to the team as a doctor or as an RGK? Like, what did game day look like? Uh, well, it actually got relatively complicated. When I actually got there, we uh, had another doctor, a guy called Craig Panther, who I work with now, who had been their club doctor for a long time, was was living in the UK and flew up for the tournament. So he was there um, 
you know, I guess as a, as a doctor as well. And so I kind of, I guess I went there thinking that I would be the doctor, but then when Richie got injured, I was like, oh, actually maybe, <laughs> maybe I better focus a little bit more in this whole goalkeeping thing. One of the interesting stories that we had from that tour was Cole Tinkler a few episodes back, who <laughs> um, claimed that uh, Craig Alexander, the assistant coach at the time, started ahead of him in an 11 v 11 training match at right back. Now, you probably would have, sounds like you would have been in goal for that training match. Can you verify that that story was, was factually <laughs> accurate, that Tink's retold? Uh, I, I can't. Um... <sighs> The, the, the worst, I, I can remember some stories about Tinks, none of them that I can actually tell you on this, uh, in this forum. But the, the story that sticks out the most for me was about uh, Luis Corrales. I'm not sure if you've ever, at the, uh, the end of the second game, um, essentially, he, I don't know what he said to Jonesy, but he said something to Jonesy and it just blew up. And my key, my key role, I think, in the whole tour was, was stopping Jonesy from killing Lewis, Louis Corrales. Um, I actually, I, he was physically chasing him around the changing rooms. It was quite something. So I sort of smothered him and, uh, and, and uh, escorted him away. It was, uh, it was a very strange situation. <laughs> so let's just follow the, the thread on your playing career, Fulch, to start with. Um, so you did a few seasons at Waikato FC and then you got picked up by Auckland City for one season as the player doctor and went to the Club yeah. World Cup. So was that the height of your your career, playing at, for Auckland City? How many games did you actually play for them? Do you know, I think a, a, a total of zero games, I think is my <laughs> uh, my career stats for Auckland City. You know, I, I was thinking, I had thought about this before, and actually um, you could argue that my career height was being the third choice goalkeeper at a tournament I didn't play in for a team that I never actually played for. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, is that my career high? Well, possibly it was. I mean, you know, you, you can say, well, look, I played a lot in the Northern League and the Central League, and I played in it, and I played in several different national leagues, which uh, you know, a lot of people don't. But, you know, I went to a, a FIFA tournament. If you talk to anyone internationally, they <laughs> they probably think that that is the highlight. So, um yeah, yeah, I guess that probably reflects my that my ability. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, and your National League career started with North Shore United. Were you playing behind Jason Batty at the time and a, and a beautifully young Roy Bell? <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of true. I uh, I flirted with the National League when I was about 20, uh, living in Wellington. I was the third-choice goalkeeper. There's a bit of a theme there um, at Miramar Rangers. So <laughs> Jamie Cooper and Jim Bannertine were the actual goalkeepers. <laughs> Um, and then I, yeah, my first actual playing experience in, in the National League was for, was for North Shore. Um, at that time, um, it was me and Roy Bell were sort of duking out for number one. And then about four games into the season, I'd sort of played the first three games. Um, it was a Confederation Cup year. Jason Batty came back and came into the squad, played one game and then got dropped um, and had to move to Cavisham to get some games. So... Uh, I was the, oh. the goalkeeper that year. Yeah. So did you last so, a whole season in, in the pipe? <laughs> yeah, I did. Surprisingly. One game. Yeah, so I played every game, yeah, apart from that one. So uh, he was he was pretty pissed, I think. He uh, he obviously needed to play to go to the Confederations Cup. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the coach was uh, Mickey Byrne. He knew, didn't know me before the season, but I, I'd actually played pretty well for the first three games, and I think he felt pretty bad about, about dropping me. And then I think Jason came in. We lost 4-0 or something like that. And he dropped Jason for me and Jason <laughs> left and I kept going. So <laughs> I, I'm sure he wasn't pleased, um, but I was pretty pleased. It was, uh, it, was, it was exciting at the time. You know, your first National League season, I'd sort of worked quite hard to get there. And uh, I, felt, uh, I felt, felt good to have the opportunity and to, to be able to keep going. So grow, growing up, Fulch, obviously 5'10", um, we've, we've dwelled on already. Um, was, it a tough, was, it, was it a tough decision to decide to really focus on being a goalkeeper at that height? Did you get a lot of stick through well, your sort of teenage, early 20 years? Well, I mean, yeah, I did. I like it. For some, I, I, I do not know why, but for my entire life, I wanted to be a goalkeeper. Um, 
and I just frankly was too small. <laughs> well, I've always been too small, but they, I, no one would let me play in goal until I was about 14 or 15. And then they were clear that, you know, no, that I was, didn't want to play anywhere else. Um, and then, um, so I started playing in goal and it wasn't really till my last year at, at school that actually I started to be any good or people started to think that I was any good. So I played for a school first 11, Wellington College. Um, and then from then I sort of just started to, to sort of make teams and, and, and keep going. Mm. And on that journey, you went to Waikato FC, played uh, under Declan Edge um, and a bunch of the sort of young Tyler Boyd and Ryan Thomas. Uh, what do you remember from that season? How did you gel with a, a Declan Edge coached side? And did you know those kids were all going to be go on to big things? Um, well, I'd played two seasons or a season and a half with, for Declan before. So the, you alluded to the start of Waikato FC. So those are my first two seasons. I knew Declan really well. Um, I'd actually quit, largely quit football again. And then uh, I'm quite good mates with Danny Donegan, uh, who I think has, has possibly provided some material for the podcast. But he, uh, he, he rang up and said, look, do you, do you want to come have a, a kind of last hurrah? And uh, I sort of thought about it like I, I kind of did. Like I, I, my last National League season, well, the season I'd played before that, I'd, I kind of um, – I guess I kind of quit halfway through, and it, I'd never quit anything ever before, and it really had a bit, left a bit of a sour taste. So I sort of agreed that I would go down, and I only went down once a week. So I trained on a Thursday and played in the weekend. Declan was just looking for someone I think that um, would go with the flow, uh, that would uh, potentially have a, a little bit of experience, and but it wasn't going to kind of, I guess, mess with what he was trying to do. So. Um, that's the kind of backstory. I wasn't really playing. I wasn't really looking to achieve anything out of it. I was just looking to to maybe have a better experience than I'd had the last time I'd played in the league. Um, and look, it was it was unbelievable, frankly. You know, the the, the football we played was ridiculous. Um, I think in the entire season, I would have kicked the ball long five times, and Deccan would have yelled at me every single time. <laughs> um, I, I genuinely believe I might be the only goalkeeper in the history of the world to take goal kicks backwards. So if you imagine <laughs> you, <laughs> you put the ball on the, on the six yard line and I would literally pass it backwards at times to people who are on the goal line. Like, I just don't know if anyone's done that before. And I, I just frankly <laughs> found the whole concept fascinating. So it wasn't like we had, uh, Jason Hicks was in the team. So he was the, sort of one of the old guys at 23, 24. Um, he obviously was trying to do something in the game. He wanted to be a pro. He wanted to achieve things. I was just kind of happy to be part of it and go along and and, uh, and enjoy myself, which I think was was probably what what Dick was after. You know, I think that he just wanted someone to come along, fill a space. Um, and he had he had big hopes for Daniel Drake, um, who in the end played a few games at the end of the season. He's gone on to be a good player. Um, but he didn't think Daniel was quite ready to to play in the team. I think, and and hence I was there. So memories of Ryan Thomas, Tyler Boyd, oh. were they in that team? Look, the, yeah, they were. They were. They were. You know, they were young. Um, Ryan Thomas was in, impossibly small, um, incredibly good. Like, I don't know whether I thought, oh, he's going to be an amazing pro or an amazing all white, but he was. They were all ridiculously good. So um, I think if we think about kids playing football now or we go watch National League now, we're kind of used to people passing it around and playing and moving and playing and moving. Whereas kind of before that, the National League was about long balls and playing to corners and it was it was completely different. So I feel like that was um, one of the legacies maybe of that season was people just started to play a lot more. The thing, like this is a, this is kind of ridiculous, but the thing that stands out for me from that season was we were played – I think Mana were two away in Taupo. I think you were there, Seamus. And we just, we <laughs> absolutely oh, mugged off Mana were two. We just mugged them off. And I remember me, Adam Thomas, and uh, Yogi, Tyler, Tyler the set, standing on the edge of the 18 yard box. And we played played triangles about four meters away from each other. Just played a triangle for about a minute. And the other team was sitting on halfway. They were waiting, waiting, waiting for us to play. And we just we just weren't going to play ever until they until they pressed. And I remember Stu Jacobs, the man with two coach, going press. 
<laughs> and we just absolutely mugged them off, just played around them, and then uh, we sort of scuffed one wide for, for a goal kick. But it was just the most premeditated kind of – just when I think about that season, I think about that because we, we were just waiting for them to let us play, and it was, uh, it was really cool. So how different was that then – so how different was that then to your first Declan experience when you came in? I think Mike Lutting might have started the season and then you came in with midway through and then you ended up being yeah. the supporters player of the year that year. But the football yeah. was very, very different. So, you know, how yeah. if you compare those two kind of errors? Look, I, I think I think Declan was still finding his way as a coach probably. Um, I, I guess he, he probably would say that he still is. But the first time... Um, there were a whole bunch of older players. I think that probably um, the personalities in the team wouldn't have allowed us to play the way that we played um, the second time around. Um, I think Jim Pamant was um, probably quite influential. Like I, I think that um, he probably wouldn't have uh, let he wouldn't have been keen on on playing football that we weren't winning. So I think winning was a big thing for him, as it was for all of us. And the only way we could do that was playing very differently. So, for example, I would say every goal kick I took that season was a long diagonal onto Adam Crump's head for a flick on and try and get Brett Derry to kind of run a mazy run into the goal. That was our main goal scoring opportunity or our main uh, uh, main uh, strike weapon, I guess, was Crumpy's flick on from my diag. So very, very different and uh, just, you know, just not even comparable the way that we were trying to play. Fulch, for a short goalkeeper, what was your? Did you make up for it by being incredibly athletic? How were you at high balls and corners, and what were your strengths as a goalkeeper? Um, I think my my main strength was I just I, I really really wanted it. So I, I when I look back on it now, I just I find it vaguely astonishing how much I wanted to win and how much I wanted to be in teams and, and how much I wanted it all. I, I just, I must have been just a miserable, horrible person to be around. So I remember uh, <laughs> training with the goalkeepers. Um, I'd want to beat them at everything. So like literally everything. So there's this one, there's this one drill where they uh, knock corners in and you compete with another goalkeeper to try and win a high ball. Um, as you could imagine, if I'm sort of competing with someone who's, maybe a foot taller than me at times. Um, probably not to win that drill very much, but I would just I'd mug them off. I'd stand on them. I'd push them. I just, I just would not allow myself to lose. So I think that was my main strength. I was also pretty athletic. Like I had a really good vertical jump. I was, I'd say I was faster than most goalkeepers. Um, look, I, I, I think I had some, some good physical attributes as well, but I think the main thing was I, I really, I think I wanted it more than anyone else, which, I think if you're playing football in New Zealand, if you're trying to be a Northern League goalkeeper or Northern League player or a National League player in New Zealand, if you if you actually want it, I, th I think you can achieve quite a bit. Just going to walk through um, a couple of um, potentially painful memories that have come up <laughs> in our research for the show. Um, talk us through the Aaron Burgess winner in the Chatham Cup semi-final uh, against Dunedin Tech in 2008. Uh, look... I, I've, I'm just, I've sort of obviously been bracing myself for this, you know. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll give you the rundown of the whole thing. So uh, at that time, I don't know what I was. I was probably 35, 36. And, and literally all I wanted, yeah, all I wanted was to win the Chatham Cup. That was the only thing that was important to me in, in football. Playing for the Rovers, um, I'd been at the, the Olympics in 2008. Um, literally landed at about 4 a.m., uh, went home, said hi to my now wife, uh, left again to go to the airport with my bag, checked in on some Jetstar flight down to Dunedin, delayed for nine hours, spent the day at the airport, get down to Dunedin, classic Dunedin day, like just unbelievably wet and shit. Um, and then the next day, I'm going to keep going. The next day, we play the game, and we just absolutely – we're the best team by a country mile, but their goalkeeper kept – he'd be, like, lying on the ground, and we'd kick it into him. It was just one of those ridiculous games. Um, and then in the last minute – so we're playing uh, into, like, this ridiculous gale. Aaron Burgess um, just sort of hoofs one from, like, the edge of our 18, and it just blows up into the wind – 
holds up in the wind and then goes over my head and drops into the far corner. And at the time, he's unbelievably apologetic for it, like unbelievable. And then next day, he's like, I see the goalkeeper off his line. And I <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, so Aaron Burgess, if you're a friend of the show, um, there was just lax class. The, the other thing that I almost derailed me was when you're a short goalkeeper, any, any sort of goal of any kind that goes over your head, it's, ah, fuck, that goalkeeper, he's too short. That goalkeeper this, that goalkeeper that. And, you know, what, what can you say? You can't say anything. You just have to nod and smile, nod and smile. So, Donegan, thanks for that one. Um, I, know that you won, <laughs> I know that you wanted to win the Chatham Cup too, but, uh, yeah, we, we uh, lost. It wasn't. It was, uh, it was deeply upsetting. The next talk, one you're going to talk about. about no, but just before <laughs> I just preempt you, the next one you're going to talk about is uh, Waikato FC against <laughs> against Waitakere out uh, in like a national league semi final. And like I, I honestly, honest to God, to this day, cannot understand how I considered that goal. So um, Jason Rowley, I think, lobs one in from all of forty meters. And is, I've given it a lot of thought, like, like a lot of deep soul searching reflection. Um, so Bunsey uh, centre back, Shay Bunce, he had a bit of a nasty habit of when he thought the goalkeeper should have it, um, he would sort of do a little duck under. Um, and so obviously he's used to playing with arguably better goalkeepers than me. So he did his duck under. And then the ball kind of by this stage is probably traveling about two kilometers an hour. Um, so trundles across the front of the goal and one of their strikers is sort of running in um, and I'm sort of thinking maybe he's going to hit it so then I kind of brace and then I I think I thought that it was going wide and it trundles into the goal and completely destroys the resurgent plucky Waikato FC uh, semi-final thing <laughs> yeah so oh, oh, I, I need a drink oh, after going dream, through it you say, yeah, yeah it was, I'll be honest it wasn't good I, I didn't actually have that down on my on my note. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. But yes. the one I was going to talk about mm, okay. was was your um, you fancy yourself as a bit of a penalty specialist. Yet <laughs> we've got it on very, very good authority that during another Chatham Cup mm. game against Papakura, you didn't save any. And That's true. one of your teammates may have refused then to take a penalty and you, you lost the match. What are your recollection recollections of that day? Yeah, that, that is pretty much how I recall. Uh, so we played Papakura away. Um, we basically spent all of our fine money on a bus. We we're going to have this big night out afterwards. It was a, it was a big thing. Um, we go to Papakura away, uh, and w we we're extremely poor, and we we're lucky to get to two all at, uh, at the end of extra time. And Dean Dodds took his boots off. <laughs> Uh, so Dean, if you're out there, I, I honestly, I don't know what was going through your head taking your boots off. You were the best player on our team. I really needed you to take a penalty. It was the Chatham Cup again, which was the only thing I actually cared about in football. And you took your boots off. I, I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, so we'll get that out of the way. So then I, I said, well, look, I'll take a penalty because the team was pretty young. And, uh, so I think I was down for the fifth penalty. I thought, well, look, we maybe have won it by then. Um, and I spent the, the first, like, I, all I could think about the entire penalty shootout was like, I'm going to have to take a penalty. <laughs> I'm going to have to take a penalty. Um, and so then uh, I don't save any. I, I scored my penalty. I genuinely, like, did a, a, a small sort of celebration. I was genuinely elated to score my penalty. And then... Uh, I've just I've forgotten the name of the guy that took the next one, but he, he was uh, 16 years old, um, quite a big, strong guy. But he he, he was never going to score his penalty. It was Dean Dodds's penalty to take, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he missed his penalty, and we we're out of the, the the Chatham Cup again. And we had this bus that we had to decide what we we're going to do with. We went to some bar in Ellerslie. I stayed for about 20 minutes, I think, and went home just grumpy and pissed off. So yeah, that was a good one. Uh, any other Donegan specials there, Seamus? Uh... No, I think that I think. My, uh, look, I'm out of I'm out of goalkeeper calamity stories. Um, Stephen, <laughs> this... where are we moving to next? No, how far did you get? Um, so you made a few Chatham Cup semi-finals. Did you actually win any domestic trophies, or did you make a Chatham Cup final? Was that the furthest you got? Uh, no, no, that was the furthest I got. We won nothing, pretty much. In my my uh, 
my entire career. Um, and only we won. Uh, I was playing for Only Younger Sports. We won the the Northern First Division, um, but I played the entire season and missed the uh, the final game, so I didn't get the uh, the celebration or anything like that. Um, I largely played for grafting teams my whole my whole career. So I played for Waterside Karori in in Wellington. Um, played for uh, Only Hunger Sports. Played for the the mighty Glenfield Rovers, and in the National League, played for the Waikato. Uh, played for North Shore. Um, didn't play for Auckland City. Um, I, I had a little a few games for for Tūranga, um, but that's uh, that's about it. Played for a couple of bad teams in Scotland. Um, mm. Well, we did win a, a trophy, actually. I can't remember what it's called, the King Cup or something, which is a, a, a team for lesser, a, a trophy for lesser Scottish teams. But, um, yeah, I'd say almost across the board, I've played for poor teams or, or grafting teams. Mm. Okay. Well, one of the reasons you are so appealing as a guest, Fulch, is because you've got that sort of two sides to you. One of them is the football, and we obviously covered some of the great stories. But the other side is how successful you've been in your professional life as a doctor. So talk to us about the timeline of playing football and studying to become a doctor and becoming a doctor and how that all overlapped and how you found time for it all. Um. Look, again, I guess it comes back to that whole thing around really kind of how much you want to do things. So obviously, um, going to medical school is reasonably busy. Um, I tell most people that the actually <laughs> the hardest part about <laughs> take, come on, the hardest part about medical school is getting in. I think, and then once you're there, it's just there's quite a, a volume of stuff to get through, but it's not it's it wasn't too bad. Um, and I, I think during most of my university studies, it wasn't, it wasn't such a big deal combining the two. It started to get hard uh, towards the end where you have to go do some hospital placements. And uh, it was really most challenging when I started to be a junior doctor. So um, you kind of, there were games where I'd sort of be on night shift and then uh, have to go to the game afterwards, uh, go to a ward round or something and then go to training afterwards. So um the people that did the roster I became very good friends with i pretty much said look you can do anything to my roster as long as i can have these uh, these games and these shifts off um and so they kind of like me they could exploit me pretty hard as long as i could get a you know saturday afternoon off or a sunday or whatever whenever the game was so that was that was a hassle um and then um during when i played national league over the summer i'd, I'd take the summer off and do some locum so um, I'd take a, you, the runs or the rotations were three month rotations. So I'd usually take three months off, um, do a little bit of kind of part time work and then, and then go back to, to, to full time work after the season. Um, but yeah, the, it wasn't ideal preparation. Sometimes you would uh, work a night shift, come home, sleep a little bit, and then you'd go meet the team on it, go fly down to Wellington and play a game or something like that. So there were, there were definitely a few occasions when it was was suboptimal. But did did you ever get close to chucking the football in and just saying it's just too much? Um, do you know the, the season I, for Waikato I was alluding to? Um, the football it was the second season of that the kind of summer iteration of the national league, and then halfway through I was studying for my uh, some entry exams for your, your specialty. So a lot of the stuff you do early on is kind of in terms of your career it's relatively less important it's just kind of getting experience in different specialties and then um, i had to study for my first major examination so say well look if you want to do this specialty you've got to pass this exam to start um, and at that at that point i wasn't playing very well um they signed harmony as another goalkeeper which was kind of a a kind of reflection on the fact that i wasn't playing very well um, and then essentially I, I, I did sort of jack it. Yeah. So I, it got a bit hard for me. I had some other things and I, I just decided to prioritize my career at that point. Um, and it just, it wasn't really me. I, I didn't really like it. I felt bad leading the team down. Um, I felt like everyone thought I was just leaving because I wasn't playing very well, which kind of was true. Um, <laughs> but, but it was, it was kind of, that was essentially, I, I sort of made a call at that time, um, to focus more on work than, uh, than football. Um, so yeah, so that's ultimately, that, that's probably the best example of that. And as you got older, 
and you were still playing, I think you said sort of early, mid-30s, you're obviously living such a different life to the large majority of your teammates. Did you find it hard to sort of, I'm not word I'm looking for here, to blend with them, to get on? Did, did you find yeah. it hard to have things in common? Yeah. Um. There's always something to have in common, you know. Like football dressing rooms are great places, as you as you both know. There's always some banter. There's always uh, some common kind of uh, things you can connect on. But like, I remember, I remember when I was a young fella. So I was maybe 22, 23, playing at only hangout with a bunch of other 22 and 23 year olds. And there was a guy called Brett Ellis, um, and he was he was the only real sort of old player in our team. And I remember at the time thinking he was just a miserable bastard. Um, he'd always come down, he'd talk about how he just shitty day at work and he'd talk about his family and this, that and the other thing. We called him <laughs> we called him we called him Trigger because his temper was so um he had such a quick temper, he'd be pissed off about everything. Um and and uh, I think I can ref- I was listening to your podcast a bit with Joe Edwards, who I, I don't know very well, but I really enjoyed the podcast once I got over the fact that he just kept talk- talking about how clever he was and, and blowing smoke up his ass. Um, the same here. They, yeah, that's right. So um, you don't need to do that. So the um, it's just around, they just didn't understand how much I had to kind of sacrifice, manipulate, or suck up just to be at training. So like my yeah. wife arguably didn't want me to be there. Um, I had, you know, young kids, um, big day at work. I'd have to sort of sacrifice some things at work that I'd have to do later in the evening just to get to training. And when guys would just piss around and not take it seriously, I just I just could not handle it. And in the end, that was really why I, I quit playing. So I, I, I think I finished playing at Only Hangar when I was about 38. And I, I didn't quit because I didn't want to play anymore. I just quit because logistically it just wasn't really feasible. And I just didn't really think that the other guys were maybe wanting it as much as me. <laughs> So it sounds a bit of like a, <laughs> sounds like a bit of a dick thing to say, but it just it just I just couldn't actually make it work anymore. Mm. So uh, anyway, so so yeah, I mean, I I think that there's there's definitely a degree of sacrifice to keep two things going um, at some sort of level. So look, I'm not suggesting that I was ever a particularly good footballer, but um, trying to blend trying to be a good footballer with trying to have a working life and a family life and whatnot. It just, it, in the end, it got too hard. Yeah. Did, yeah. did you, you um, go on. oh, go on, Steve. Mine's, mine's completely off track, which, I, which is what I do. So you keep going on a, on a, <laughs> on a proper three well, you, before I divert. You, you, you mentioned Joe Edwards, and I, I sort of see you guys as similar characters who have risen to the top of your field. I was quite interested in his backstory about how he became the man he is. And I'd like to delve the same way into you. Um, were you always the straight A student at school? Were you always just very dedicated to your learning? Were, is there any rough edges to you? Um, I, I definitely wasn't the straight A student. So it was interesting, actually. My, my parents recently brought up all my school reports, and they, they were pretty bad, actually. So I'd say um, through my high school, I didn't, I didn't really put too much effort in, and so that comes across in all the school reports. Um, I, I was okay. I wasn't like I was a bad student. I was, I was decent. And then um, I remember going to university and having no real idea about what I wanted to do. And then I guess the, I guess the thing that – one of the things – I guess once I've decided that I want to do something, I, I, I'm pretty good at working hard to try and achieve that goal. So I remember about – you know, just starting my second year at university, I didn't go to medical straight off. I went to, I started out doing a commerce degree actually at, at Vic and uh, did a few science papers, did these commerce papers and then realized pretty quickly I didn't want to do a commerce degree and swapped to a science degree and then quite quickly decided I wanted to go, uh, go to medical school. And so I remember working really hard to get grades that were good enough to go to medical school. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, there's not really scale skeletons in the closet i don't i don't know that i've been um particularly studious my whole life i don't know that i've been particularly obsessed with being um smart or anything like that but i have been pretty good at working hard and i think when i set myself a goal i'm i'm, I'm quite good at, at working towards trying to achieve that mm. talk us through that medical school experience because we all kind of have an idea that you know there's hijinks and there's 
sort of testing things on yourself or testing things on your mates? As you were learning, was there any of that sort of stuff? Did you ever like take an <laughs> IV line home to try and deal with a hangover on a Sunday, get some saline into the system? Did any of that sort of stuff happen? Uh, well, it is, um, it's an interesting envir environment. Um, one of the things that's interesting about it is mostly um, there's a whole lot of people there that, that are pretty, pretty nerdy, I suppose, for want of a better word. So there's a whole lot of people that um, have come from a background at school where they were the clever one or um, they were the, the kind of nerdy one. And so the fact when you go there and you play a bit of sport or you're, you're kind of a, you're suddenly a, a, a kind of a bit of an outlier, I suppose. So that was an interesting thing. Um, the other is there are a lot of smart people there. And then so you suddenly realize that there's some ridiculously smart people. Um, and, and I can uh, just remember spending time with some guys that were just super good people, but just ridiculously clever um, and being pretty intimidated by that. Um, and then there's a whole lot of things around just shared experiences. Like you, you kind of, uh, when you there's a whole lot of things like you spend some time in a cadaver lab. So cadavers are people that have donated their body so that you can dissect them and learn your anatomy. So um, it's kind of, uh, unless you've sort of experienced that, it's sort of a bit like walking into the cadaver lab with a hundred other people and seeing all these, um, these bodies for dissection, you know, you do have these shared experiences. And so, yeah, you, when you're learning how to take blood, you learn how to take blood out of each other. When you're learning how to put IV lines in, you're learning how to do that in each other. So, yeah, it's, um, it, I mean, it's, it is kind of, in some ways, if you actually think about it objectively, your learning skills, it's no different from any other kind of uh, professional qualification, but actually the types of skills are, are quite different, which probably makes it more intriguing and, things that want people want to talk about or listen about mm. well i don't know i'm actually quite interested in the things that you've seen that have been inside people's bodies but i guess patient confidentiality <laughs> prevents you from actually talking about that openly uh i do remember um <laughs> i do remember uh, a bus ride um so when i was playing it for the waikato i was living in tauranga um in the bit there were a bunch of guys um tinks and uh, a few others that we drive over from tauranga to uh to waikato and I, I worked in a general surgical clinic um, for a while. And so in general surgery, there's, there's lots of sort of asses and, uh, <laughs> and sort of butt-related stories. I shouldn't, so, I shouldn't laugh, but it's funny. Sorry. Yeah, so we, we meet, in the, um, we meet in, the, uh, in the car park. I can't remember, in the little sort of town at a petrol station on the way out, heading towards over the, the mm. Kai Mines. Just forgotten the name of the, the town. Anyway, so in a, in a van. Oh, uh, Kino, isn't it? Yeah, uh, possibly. So there's, there's Craig Flower Day, I think, was a, a draftsman. He's like, oh, yeah, tough day with the clients, you know, worst ever. And the client demanding, demanding. And then someone else is a builder. Like, oh, it was the worst day building today. It was super wet and just so wet. And uh, one of the guys was a, a teacher at Tauranga Boys. And he's like, oh, the kids were just, just little shits today. And I was like, boys, see this finger? This finger has been inside at least 20 dudes today. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember them looking at me like they just they just couldn't get their head around the fact that that was actually true and I was like that that happened today that happened <laughs> um, and, and things like that is when you work in medicine it's just it's normal like it's just really not a problem for me it's something I've done <laughs> literally thousands of times probably <laughs> um, but you know like unless you've kind of experienced that or unless you've kind of um you know, worked in that sort of situation. Mark Jermaine tells a great story. Oh. It's cut out. Was it a great story? Maybe uh, it's been edited out of the podcast area. What's well, happening? Just lost a good man. Shay, you, you with us? Oh, I think we've got some, I think we've got some oh, there you go. delay you're here. Back. Yep. No, you're back. You just cut out. Start yeah, an again, allegedly mate. good story from Michael Maine from you, apparently. <laughs> well, let's start again. So Michael Michael Main tells, tells a great story of a, a car ride that he shared with you where you said that it would be possible to perform a vasectomy at a barbecue. Um, <laughs> is that something that could be done medically? Uh, well, it could be done. In fact, um, Mark, Mark Paston, uh, for, there were a few tours there where every time Mark Paston showed up on tour, his wife was pregnant again. Um, <laughs> 
And so we talked a little bit about how um, at whatever his last tour was, I was going to do a vasectomy on the tour. Um, and so um, that was the subject of much banter and, and uh, discussion. But yeah, it would be feasible. Um, probably in reality, not a good idea and not something I'd be interested in actually doing. But uh, for banter, it was, it was a very good source of banter. Because I actually oh, flicked I've got a, Michael. I've got a medical question for you, which um, sure. I'm hoping you can can give some <laughs> advice on. Um, Seamus has this joke in his repertoire, which should have been retired when he was about 14, <laughs> but it involves slapping people, slapping people in the nuts um, when yeah. they're not paying attention, you know, just really sort of stupid stuff um but we were on a night out and there was a good group of us and michael main was one of the people and he'd had a vasectomy the day before <laughs> and seamus didn't either didn't know or forgot or didn't care but at about 11 o'clock at night when we'd all had a absolute skin full of booze seamus has done the knock in the nuts to Michael Main, and it set off just the mist came down if you've ever seen Michael Main angry man it's a scary sight and he lost and he, I think he, he swung on Shay and it, there was there was all sorts of drama what sort of damage could that have done if the the knock had been in the the wrong place so like I think uh, in reality it was a, a fairly safe but but possibly uh, just shit thing to do um, <laughs> okay <laughs> um, my own experience of a vasectomy actually was just was not that big a deal. Um, coach football the next day, um, maybe one paracetamol. It was, uh, I, I'd say, Manny maybe just needs to to toughen up a little bit. Sounds hilarious, <laughs> hilarious banter from you, Seamus. It's great. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. It wasn't it wasn't one of my finest moments. I was pretty remorseful. For was it about, that sort uh, of have you, week? Have you have you been to Thailand? Is that the how it started or? You've lost me on that one. Bangkok, isn't? Ah, uh, good. Yeah, so good. you could maybe you could maybe uh, use that if you wanted to. <laughs> I've, 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 I think I've retired. I've retired the gag. Full stop. Uh, okay. Um. Okay, Shay. I thought you thought you were going to pick one up there, but uh, <laughs> I guess I'll go again. Um. Okay, I've got a I've got a story that came in from um, a, a friend and, and a colleague, and he writes about a, a bizarre sort of fashion statement that you made on a tour. I'm just trying to find exactly um, in my notes <laughs> where where I'm going with this. Um, it's not it's not it really your first, does, but... Okay, so it was your first tour to Samoa with the um, under-20 women's national team with John Herdman. Mm. And this member of staff suggests that every day on the tour, for some reason, you wore knee-high socks. And he never asked you about it, and he never got the, the answer of why that was. But was that just the way that you wore your socks back then, or what was the reason? I'm wondering if this colleague is Seamus, um, but the the tour, everyone wore their socks up. There was a uh, a Paul Smalley sort of uh, vibe running through the camp. Um, we had uh, John Herbin, who who was a, who was a great guy. Um, he he really wanted things to be done properly and professionally, and so all of us wore our socks up. It's possibly my only only socks up tour. So I can only conclude that uh, whoever wasn't pulling their socks up maybe hadn't got the memo. It was uh, we we're trying to be very professional, and we had all of our all the staff had socks up at all times. Uh, was my memory of the tour? Okay, well that contrasts with uh, with what we were told. Apparently, you were the only member of staff with the socks high, but it seems like a little bit of he said she said there. So yeah, um, I think I think that member of staff may have been the same one that that taped Sarah Gregorius to the examination couch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, against her will. Uh, I'm not sure. Wow. But, um, it may have been. We'll, yeah. have get, we'll have to get Gregor's on one day to, yeah. um, to corroborate so, that story. Mm. So, the upshot of that gag was that uh, the aforementioned head coach, John Herbin, walks into the medical room as Sarah Gregorius is being taped onto the bench. And I was, I was pretty sure that that might have been the end, uh, the beginning and the end of my uh, career working for New Zealand football. Um, <laughs> but but fortunately, they kind of moved on. 
Fulch, you've um you've obviously been to a lot of World Cups and major events in in football. Um, what are the experiences? I, I know you've worked with well, well, a lot of All Whites coaches, Ricky Herbert, Anthony Hudson. Um, you linked up with the All Whites, I think, pa- post two thousand and ten World Cup. What are your what are the experiences that stand out, and and how were your relationships with the the coaches in those camps? Um, the, well, the first thing was there's just some incredible life experiences, things that um, possibly I, I never really thought that I would get to experience. So um, ones that stand out for me, I remember my, my first sort of footballing memories as a child was watching the, the World Cup in Mexico. Um, and so being involved a game in a game at the Azteca Stadium was, was pretty unbelievable. So um, just to kind of, if you think about that stadium, it's it's really old Um it's got a, a tunnel that is, that's too small for any sort of modern buses to drive through. It's got cobblestones. It's got pictures, history everywhere. So that that was uh, definitely something that stands out for me. Um, going to my first Olympics, so Olympics in Beijing, um, just for me, well, I'll always remember the feeling I had being part of that Olympics and walking around the Olympic Village and um, just the feeling that... Uh, you were kind of part of it, a small part of it, granted. Um, and so I think that there are some some pretty incredible experiences. Um, I would say my relationship with the coaches w- was okay. I'd say my relationship with uh, the players probably probably stronger. Um, made some incredible um, friendships and incredible relationships with both uh, the playing group, but also the the people I've worked with. And and, and you'd be a good example of that, Shamer. So. I think, you know, just being around football, um, being around kind of like-minded people and being able to help contribute to something um, that that you kind of believe in. You know, like I, I've spent a lot of my life trying to be a footballer, um, never being particularly good, but I think we're all quite invested in football in general. I think a lot of us are really invested in New Zealand football being good. Um, so being able to be part of that, I think, was uh, was a privilege, or is a privilege. Was that always the master plan when you started medical school? Was the thinking that I'll be a doctor and then I'll work my way up and be an all whites doctor and still stay involved in football and go to all these things? Was that that the go? Uh, I, yes and no. So when I started off at medical school, I guess. I thought that maybe I would work in sport. Uh, I guess I, that's probably true. Um, and then you go through medical school and you kind of experience lots of different specialties and you experience lots of different things. And and I I then, I just, I didn't think that that was on my radar anymore. Um, and then for whatever reason, kind of came full circle and, and started to work in sports medicine and decided that that was the specialty for me. And at that point, I guess it was, it was, it was a, a really nice way to keep the involvement with football. So um, I was sort of not playing as much and I had a few opportunities to go away with teams. Um, and, uh, and and yeah, so yeah, at that point, it was um, something that I was, I was very keen to do. Um, possibly the, the traveling with teams, I've, I've kind of uh, lost some of the love for, um, but still being able to be involved with football, I think is really important to me. Um, I enjoy working with some community football. I think I've got uh, more of an opportunity to have uh, an impact there. So uh, around some injury prevention projects and some other things that we've got on the go. Um, one of the things that I kind of never really liked that much about traveling with, uh, with the national teams was that a, a good tour for you, well, professionally a good tour for you was when something bad happened, um, whereas everybody wanted you a good tour for them as if you did nothing. And then yeah. professionally, it was quite unsatisfying. You just end up sitting around, filling drink bottles, um, doing the laundry yeah. stuff. You just get involved. But I sort of just felt towards the end that maybe I could be having a much bigger impact just going to my clinic and seeing people with injuries. Um, yeah. Maybe I could have a much bigger impact doing something different. So uh, I still I still really enjoy being involved with football you know, as a doctor. Um, but maybe my desire or my feelings about my usefulness as a team doctor maybe has changed over time folks we had um gordon watson on again one of the early episodes and and gordon's done a bunch of 
of FIFA tournaments. How many have you done? Do you like as from a team perspective, and also from like a FIFA medical officer perspective? Have you got a running tally on the amount that you've been to? Uh, uh, short answer is no. Um, I think I've been to, I think I've been to every type of of FIFA tournament except futsal. Um, so that's under seventeen men's, women's. Uh, under 17, uh, under 20 men's and women's. I've been to the Olympics with the men, been to the Olympics with the women. I've been to a women's World Cup and I've been to a men's World Cup. Um, and we've talked about going to the Confederations Cup. I've been to a beach soccer World Cup as well. <laughs> That's one talk, of the, talk the, about, Yeah, talk to us about the beach soccer World Cup in the Bahamas 2017. That sounds like a shit so, place to go for a tournament. <laughs> yeah, so um, I went there as uh, a FIFA medical officer. So my main role there was to make sure that the medical services were, were delivered as uh, as per, you know, quote unquote, FIFA standard, um, and then to do uh, doping control. So each, each game at a World Cup tournament, typically four players will have uh, a drug test at the end of it. <laughs> So um, the the tough part was I, I stayed in this hotel called the Atlantis. Um, it had a, a water slide that went through a shark tank. So and just to kind of put the hotel in context, it was a real a real crapper. Um, I showed Sounds up at the, the beach soccer world, world cup. I don't know whether people know, but um, Tahiti is a proper world power in beach football. So they've come second, I think, three tournaments in a row. Um, so I don't know if anyone's ever watched beach football, but um, no one kicks the ball along the ground. They flick it up and they kick it around. They all just overhead kick city. It's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, medical services in the Bahamas were challenging and we had some pretty strange stuff happen there. Um, someone had a, an acute psychotic episode, which was, which was challenging. Um, there's an outbreak of gastro at the hotel. Uh, so, you know, these things, they are, they can be, um, they can be really fun, but they can be really quite, quite difficult. So I think you sort of think uh, a group of young, healthy, fit people um, at a football tournament, why do they kind of need a medical support? But actually, you'd be surprised by how much happens. Um, if I think about the under 20 World Cup in New Zealand that we had a couple of years ago, there was a a measles outbreak there was uh, a, a visiting official with acute tb just all sorts of things that you end up dealing with just because there's a whole bunch of people in one place and your um oceania's representative to the fifa medical committee what does that actually mean um that is a good question seamus um it does mean uh, that i attend two meetings a year in zurich or uh at the moment one meeting a year in zurich and one uh, on the phone, but basically it gives you an opportunity to have a sort of governance role in the way that the medical aspects of the game are being delivered and managed. So um, obviously one of the things that that uh, keeps coming up again and again is around how football managers concussion or deals with concussion um, and whether we're doing a good job there, whether there's things we could be learning from other sports um we've done a bit of work around heat illness um sudden cardiac arrest so um i don't know if you know but about one one play one professional player per month on average dies of a cardiac arrest wow. so we've had um there's there's quite a few things where we've probably made some meaningful and tangible impact on the health and safety of the game um, but in my view there's there's a few areas where i think we've still got some work to do but yeah it's a it's a good example of, you know, I've spent a lot of time traveling with teams and I, I've really found that rewarding, but I think potentially there's a lot more scope for me to have a, a, a meaningful impact with some of those governance type roles. Steve, what is your, just, for, 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 what is your position? <laughs> oh God, it's tough, isn't it? What is, I'm just going to go there. What is your position on concussion in football? Um, with heading, we had Declan on. He sort of suggested that his, he doesn't allow heading for the majority of his young players. Um, there's a lot in the news at the moment about whether yeah. it should be allowed. What's your position? Well, it, my take on Declan was that he just uh, he just didn't like heading. <laughs> he just didn't like the concept <laughs> of the ball leaving the grass because uh, it meant that you weren't properly passing it. So, um, I guess 
I, I spend a lot of my working life thinking about this sort of thing. And I guess the acid test for me is I've, I've got three young boys. Um, two of them are obsessed with football. I think the third one's on his way to being obsessed. And I'm, I'm really comfortable with them playing the game under the current rules. So the, there's two kind of distinct things. There's, there's one is around if you have a concussion and your brain is not working properly, what does that mean for your life? Um, versus the other is does hitting a ball over time um, that doesn't cause any short-term problem, does that lead to long-term problems? And at the moment, we just, we frankly don't know. Um, I think for some people, uh, probably there is a predisposition predispos for some people having um, a cumulative effect of certainly the concussions, I think, but maybe hitting over time. But I think for the majority of us, I, I, I just, I personally don't believe that that's leading to long-term cognitive problems based on the evidence that we have at the moment. Would you be comfortable with your kids playing rugby? Um, again, I, I would be. Um, so the, the thing for me is if you have a concussion, I think it's really important that that's managed carefully. Um, and that looks like um, resting until you've got no symptoms and then taking a, a really sensible graduated approach about getting back to, to playing football or whatever sport it is. Um, what I think is lunacy is some parents and some coaches, are, they're just trying to uh, extrapolate what happens with professional players to young players um, and get them back as quickly as we can. So I think that that is just madness. Um, I think if uh, my kids started to have a second concussion or a third con concussion, um, then at that point, I think I'd be starting to have a, a really kind of um, long conversation about whether that sport, whatever it was, was, was sensible for them. One of the things that I think is interesting is that at the same time that the footballing codes are under, you know, real serious scrutiny about whether we should be doing a better job around concussion and whatnot, you've got the rise of combat sports, MMA, um, and the whole idea is to inflict a head injury on, on the opponent. So and we're seeing a, a massive explosion in those types of sports. Um, and I can understand why, but at the same time, we're really getting a bit tough on football and rugby and rugby league and saying, look, you need to be doing a better job, which which we do. Um, but there's a bit of a disconnect, I think, between the, the kind of dialogue um, between those those two types of sports. Um, you, you're, um, you're actually quite an, you mean, you're an authority to talk about the rugby examples because you were a team doctor for Counties Manukau in the old ITM Cup. Um, yeah, I looked at... <laughs> There's, there's a, I mean, there's a question. There's a famous scene, or kind of a famous kind of part of the movie, Any Given Sunday, which is around NFL, which kind of puts the spotlight on the team doctor wanting to, and you alluded to it just before, wanting to get players back out on the field. Um, is that something that is more prevalent in other sports than it is in football, or is that something that's kind of a pressure that comes with being a team physician and having having a coach wanting that player to go back on, or the player wanting to go back on, and then in your professional capacity saying, well, actually, this isn't in your best interest to get back on the field. Yeah, so I think there's, there's kind of two things I want to kind of talk about there. One is that there's no, there's no doubt the cultures in different sports um, are, are very different. Um, the second is just around the role of the team doctor. You know, I think 10, certainly 20 years ago, the whole role of the team doctor, they're basically a fan, and their job was there to, to stitch people back together and make sure that they could go play a game whether it was sensible for them or not. So I think that the, the, the role of the team doctor has changed a lot, particularly over the last sort of decade, to being much more of an advocate for the players, um, managing their problem and, and trying to get them back to play as quickly as possible. Um, but it's not about patching them up and getting them straight back on the field. It's about making sensible, informed decisions, working with the player. So I think sometimes um, the concussion example is a good one. You know, the, the player's really not in a position to make an informed decision about what they should be doing because they're impaired. Uh, whereas sometimes, you know, St Steve would know about hamstring injuries. So um, sometimes you're sending someone back to play before you want to, but it's an informed decision about, you know, look, it's a, it's a big game. I'd rather you'd had a couple more games of, uh, you know, playing 45 minutes, but you know, it's the final, so let's push it a bit hard. So um, I think, so So that's the role of the team doctors changed a lot. If you think about different sports, I think football is by and large uh, kind of, they're tough to deal with. They're sort of quite miserable. Um, I think often 
there are at the professional level there are so many different things influencing whether that player wants to to play so um what is their contract status what is it so in international football it's about what does their club manager want so that whole thing like people slaughter players for not playing for new zealand but um, there are so many examples of players flying back for some frankly meaningless international losing their spot in their team and then having to spend the next six or seven weeks trying to get back into the team um, the team that actually pays their salary so uh, football is there's a whole lot of things that are not related to football which impact their recovery or not recovery from an injury versus say in rugby rugby in my experience um, rugby players want to play no matter what so their arm could be broken and hanging off and they'll just want me to tape it back up and get back out there for the brothers. So it's just like it is a totally different. And then in the middle is um, rugby league, where I think there's that professionalism has been around a lot longer. There's a lot more sense of themselves, but there's still that real team and cultural element that I think that you get in rugby. So um, those three sports, I think, are on a spectrum of you know, just the way that people deal with injuries and their realities around um, the things that are driving that, they're, they're quite, quite different. So where does netball sit on that spectrum? <laughs> so, so look, I, looking back, I looked after the Silver Ferns for, for two or three seasons and looking back on it, it was, it was some of the most fun sports medicine that I've ever done. So um, I'll go... <laughs> Uh, so they, they were unbelievably uh, good at dealing with their own shit. So they'd fill up their own drink bottles if you asked them to, to ice something or um, they would go make their own breakfast. They were incredibly self-reliant, which I think kind of reflected the fact that um, that they hadn't been professional for very long. And I think that their culture was much around um, kind of being doing things for themselves. Um, the... Uh, so, so they were just they were really good to deal with. I'd say by and large, um, those players were, were 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 just a. Well, I guess they just they were just super easy to deal with. They weren't all like that, but I'd say as a generalisation, um, they're a, they're a fun group. I'm off on one, Steve. So I'm going to ask another. I'm going to ask another one. This time is comparing that to tennis. So I know Axis Sport Medicine is is the medical provider for the ASB open and the ASB classic here in Auckland. So what's, are you hands on with tennis players? Do they bring their own medical entourage? What does that look like? Um, so, so look, I've been involved with the, the tennis for, well, for more than 10 years. And um, number one, it's a great tournament to be involved with, like truly international field, um, incredibly well-organized, well-run tournaments. Um, and um, incredibly well run and well organized medical services. So the women's tour, they travel with their own trainers who pretty much know everything about all of the players. And so you um, you are there to help when they're they're not happy. So if there's a more significant injury or there's some medication that's required or some imaging or investigations, um, then you can get quite involved. Um, and then the men's the men's tour is a little bit I guess a little bit more relaxed. They still travel with their own trainers, um, but it's a much more kind of laid back kind of vibe, I would say. Um, but it, it, they're a fascinating group. Like if you're in the, the top 10 in the world, then you've got an unbelievably good life. You entourage, um, probably top 20. If you're in the top 50 in the world, things are still pretty good for you. Um, but the, it's just a ruthless environment. If you're outside the, the top 50 or certainly outside the top 100, you roll into Auckland, you're staying in a hotel, um, you come and play some qualifiers, you maybe get locked, knocked out in the first round of qualifiers, make $200, um, and then you physically don't can't afford to leave that tournament to go to the next one until the next tournament opens. So they, they come to the tournament every day, they eat their lunch there, they eat their breakfast there, they kind of sift around until the next tournament opens and they can leave. So you know, for, for some, it's certainly a super glamorous lifestyle, but you know, the, the whole the whole dream of being a professional athlete is uh, is I, I think sometimes um, just that it's a dream and so I often tell people that you know they when they find out that maybe I played a little bit of football they say oh look were you any good and I was like no no not that good um, and then they're like uh, do you wish you'd made it and I said well look actually the best thing that could ever have happened to me 
was the fact that I just wasn't a little bit better. Because if I was a little bit better, I would have jacked medical school. I was so into football at that time in my life, I would just I would have quit it for sure. I would have mm. gone and signed some contract. Um, I was going to say in Singapore, but um, I don't want to sort of <laughs> good, <laughs> good. Some people too. Anyway, yeah. So um, anyway, so I would have signed some crappy contract somewhere, and I would have gone from one four month contract to another two month contract or whatever. But I wasn't good enough. So that and I, reflecting back on it now. I think I got the absolute best out of football. You know, like I was, I uh, had the, the mateship, the friendship. I had the competition. Um, I felt like I probably um, was the best that I could be um, as a sort of midget goalkeeper. Um, but I didn't sacrifice my career. I've you know, got a relationship I'm very happy with. I've got kids I love. You know, like I, uh, I feel like I kind of got it all. Um, but if I was just a little bit better at football, I might have screwed it all up. On the other hand, maybe I wouldn't have. Maybe I'd have had a better life. It might have been amazing. But uh, you might, you might have reflect. gone all the way. You might have gone right to the top. <laughs> yeah, Jorge Campos. Hey, maybe. gonna gonna switch tack a little bit here, um, Fulch. I've got something in my notes which I'm not a hundred percent on, but I'm hoping you might be able to fill in some of the blanks. Apparently, you might have inadvertently played a role in a rather high-profile New Zealand footballer's transfer at some point along the line. Ring a bell. Um, yes, I think I know what you're getting at there. Um, I, how much I can kinda, you tell I'll, us? <laughs> I'll tell you like in broad terms. So, um, player comes back to New Zealand having been out, um, with, with injury, um, and has in his contract the opportunity to get an opinion from, uh, an independent party. So he comes back to New Zealand, gets opinion from me, um, comes in, we have a bit of a yarn, a bit of a catch-up, good to see you, have a look at injury. The side injury looks pretty pretty good. Uh, right comprehensive report saying, look, uh, can't find any problems here, uh, looks ready to go. Um, I'd have you know, no hesitation signing him off. I, I think that maybe it's been a bit conservative. Here's a few things that he could potentially work on, but looks good. Player goes goes home uh, next week. Player signs for new club, uh, but and you know based on clean bill of health. <laughs> so I'm like, um, I feel <laughs> like I've been manipulated somewhat. Here. So, <laughs> but yeah, in reality, I wasn't. In reality, I provided the opinion that it was my opinion. It wasn't like I was uh, providing something that I I didn't think was. Um, was accurate, so I, I didn't feel like I'd been too exploited, but I was kind of like, well, maybe maybe they could have just told me what was going on, <laughs> and I might have felt a little bit less dirty about it, but yeah, so that, is that what you're getting at? I think so, yeah, I yeah. think that's, that's the one, good. Hey, um, Fulch, we're sort of mid-April, I don't want to timestamp that, I know Shay hates that, but um, we're hey, right we in the middle, we're right in the middle of this covid crisis uh, basically in the middle of a uh, four-week lockdown what does that mean for you are you uh, currently being deployed as an essential worker so in you know if you look at it i am defined as an essential worker but um i sort of i, I personally don't really feel that all of my work is that essential so um i have a clinic in auckland access um we've got about 15 or 16 doctors that work there and we made the decision that we would see uh, all our patients remotely, so we're still uh, still operational, but we're seeing patients through telehealth. So that means that players, our patients, will log on. Uh, we'll see them in a similar format to this. We'll do an examination. We can still show them their imaging. We can still do all the things that we normally do, um, but we're not physically seeing the patients unless they've got a more significant problem. So you know, we kind do you of wear those headphones when you're doing it. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for drawing attention to that. So, um, just so that the uh, the viewers, straight listeners, know, the headphones are, are, are red, possibly a little pink, um, and I'm wearing them purely because uh, Seamus uh, thought he couldn't hear me. But uh, I think it might be part of the elaborate stitch up. So I just wondered what no. time you knocked off from the airport, considering there's so many flights <laughs> that are coming in. Um, I'm just so, so the answer is no, no headphones. The audio seems to work just fine for my uh, for my medical consults, just not for this podcast. <laughs> well, it's, it is different times. Um, I don't mean to cut you off there with that well-placed gag, but um, 
it obviously has changed things a little bit with you being based at home for the whole two weeks. How do you juggle the whole work-life balance? You said you've got three young kids, you've got the wife, you spend probably a million hours a week at the office. Is it actually quite good being home and is that something you struggle with? Uh, I, look, the actual being at home has been great. So I have uh, spent a lot more time with the kids and a lot more time with Helen and uh, my parents are actually staying with us. They've my father's been unwell, so so having them all around and being able to be you know physically present with them has been great. Um, professionally, it's been a, an absolute nightmare. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I'm currently sitting in my shed um, where I do most of my work from. The internet sort of uh, been been breaking every few hours, uh, which has been excellent. I love IT. Um, uh, Mondays and Tuesdays, my wife is a GP, so she's actually doing some some meaningful work at the moment. So she goes to the clinic, and uh, I'm trying to do my my work and look after three kids. Um, it's been a lot of television. Um, essentially, I just I felt continually like I've been a bad parent, uh, stroke bad uh, clinic runner, stroke bad everything. So uh, that's been been horrible. Um, and then on a on a Wednesday Thursday, I, I actually go to the clinic to see my patients. Um, and to help kind of supervise some some kind of essential services there, so it uh, it does get me out of the house, and it it does mean that I, I get a bit of a break, which I, I think has been good for me. But it's been a break that I I need to do my job. Um, and then the Friday um, I'm working from home, and my wife's here, so it's it's a lot more manageable. But um, it you know it's I, as you would imagine, you know, everybody's in the same boat. It's a, a strange uh, time. There's been lots of children on uh, on phone calls. There's been um, varying responses to that from a uh, very cute child to what's that child doing? Can you ask him to leave? Um, but they're, they're not experiences that are, are unique to me. I think we're all in the same boat. Are you keeping up to speed on all the latest uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, research? Like, do you pour over that stuff? Do you need to be on top of what's actually happening? Um, I, I, do you know, like, I, I'm somewhere in the middle. So I'm certainly, um, I'm certainly taking the whole thing very seriously, as I think we all should be. So I've got some very close friends that uh, have been involved in Italy and have seen firsthand how terrible this has been when it when it gets out of hand. Um, another colleague who works at University of Washington in Seattle, and he's had the same. So I am, I think, very aware of, of what it could be like. And um, the whole lockdown and uh, what's happening with with the virus in New Zealand, I think uh, I keep a very close eye on. Um, but I'm not one of these guys that kind of pours over every little thing and, you know, has there been a new case reported here? Has there been a new case? What I am interested in are things that kind of di directly relate to me. So um, we made the decision uh, to suspend football quite early on. So um, thinking about when football might start again and, and when that might be safe, uh, I, I spend quite a bit of time thinking about thinking about um, if what what needs to happen for me to want to start seeing patients normally at the clinic. So when patients um, are injured, you know, footballers with busted knees or whatever, when actually do I think it's sensible that we start to address those problems properly? So um, at the moment, I think it's safe for, for me and for the patient probably to stay home most of the time. Um, but at some point in the near future, and that's going to change. So this one will finish at the end of... Uh, of the four weeks um, i don't think that well this is not suddenly going to go away in in two weeks three weeks it's uh it's the next thing will happen so i spent a lot of time thinking about what that will look like so talk to us you, you spend a lot of time thinking about when football will restart best mm -hmm. case scenario when will it restart and would it have to restart under conditions like i'm talking northern league where you're not allowing cr crowds to watch the games or just be played by the players is that best case scenario sort of june well i mean frankly who would know so at the moment you know we're two weeks into the lockdown just time stamp it even more for you um we we really are like we're looking pretty good so you could argue whether the absolute number of cases is accurate or not based on us not testing as much as maybe we should. But if I look at metrics like um, people, ICU admissions, there's, just, there's not been that many. 
Um, if I look at the, the fatalities, there's not been that many. Um, so I think at this stage, we're, we're, we're going much better than I thought we would be at this point. So let's assume it continues to go well. Um, do, this is these are my own personal feelings, not New Zealand football's feelings or, or whatnot. But I I just I'm not sure that I think it's sensible that we play football in an organised way this year. So I just think there's so much uncertainty. So I would need to see um, a fairly prolonged period where there were no new or minimal new cases in a landscape where we're still doing lots of testing and looking. Um, before I sort of thought that was a good idea to send my kids to play football up at Three Kings. Um, but, you know, look, you can mitigate the risk and certainly um, having, having no crowd, that's definitely going to be helpful. Um, we're, our clinic's involved in the Warriors, and so we're looking at what's going to happen with the Warriors and um, their plans to send everyone off to an island off Queensland and, and kind of have everyone in isolation. And, you know, could, could it be done? Well, well yeah, actually, it probably could. Um, but at a community or recreational level, wh what is football about? Well, for me, I have a pretty strong view that football is mostly about having a good time and competition and camaraderie. So for the majority of us, even those that are trying to you know, be the, the best player, only hung out, whatever, you boil it down while we're doing it, we're doing it f for fun, pretty much. And I just think that we'd have to make sure that that the probability of it being fun was far, far higher than the probability of it um, costing people's lives. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, thanks for sharing your personal views there. Yeah, it would be so different, wouldn't it, if, if there was no crowd and there was no aftermatch and no one was really witnessing what was happening and these strict rules around absolutely every part of it. Yeah, it would, would be a very different experience. Yeah. And look, I think in reality, what we'll see, what we'll see in our day to day life is we'll go from some, some very rigid um, sort of can't do anything to, you know, you can do a little bit more, you can do a little bit more, you can do a little bit more. And then we're kind of approaching something that's more, more like normal. Um, but I, I just, I, I feel like that's likely to be quite slow. So the, the, the New Zealand football kind of thing is we'll reassess this towards the end of May, which I think is sensible. And you never know, like we could be going great in May and we could be in a position where we're going to start playing football again. Uh, most kids, if we go back to level three, they'll be going to school. So you could make a pretty strong argument that if you're at school, what's the difference playing football? Except if you're at school, you're seeing the same kids every day, you go up to three kings and then suddenly you're exposed to 10 schools. Yeah. So, um, there's probably ways that you can get back to playing organized football that, that kind of Still that concept, which I don't like the, the word bubble. So you know, maybe you have more school football and you play against the teams from your school so that you're containing the, the number of exposures. There, there are possibly different ways to do that. But um, I, I think until we understand the reality that we're living in, it's very hard to plan for it. Okay, good. Um, well, let's jump around a, a little bit more. Uh, one of the, oh, I, the common... Oh, sorry, can, Go on, I just, to, can I just talk COVID again? Um, sorry to kind of keep flogging, flogging the same topic, but Fulch, you, you mentioned that you are having to, to work from home um, through this kind of COVID lockdown. Is that made um, any more comfortable by the fact that your home was actually featured in New Zealand Home and Garden about this time last year? <laughs> um, um, yeah, yeah, it is. It's uh, it's very comfortable, Seamus. And uh, the uh, the day that that was was uh, those pictures were taken um was among among the worst of my life um, <laughs> the the amount of cleaning um to get said house into said state was was quite something um but the, the worst part was uh was i've got three boys as i said before i sort of thought that you know they, they take pictures with the family in the house and whatnot i sort of thought that maybe they come in and they might spend 30 minutes taking pictures of me and the kids and, and then we'd leave uh, was, no, they, they wanted the kids to stay all day so that the sun was just right for this shot and that shot um, and trying to keep your house looking kind of neat and tidy and uh, try and stop the boys from killing each other. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a tough day. Um, but, and, you know, and, worth it for this sort of conversation. Surprising also <laughs> how many people actually have seen it. I sort of thought it would go, un <laughs> go under the radar and it would just be a sort of thing that would happen. Um, but no, pretty much everybody 
somebody I know uh, has seen it and has had some sort of comment or banter about it. So, so thanks for bringing it up. It's good. Well, and the other thing, actually, folks, is that, of course, Bauer Media, um, who did publish New Zealand Home and Garden, have, have gone under. Um, and that's not actually the only time that you've personally been affected by a company going under through through COVID, because Radio Sport, where you had a, a regular feature with Daniel McCarty, is actually also no longer broadcasting. So, I mean, that's tough. That's tough because you built up quite a following on the um, on the radio sport afternoons. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. It was a sort of interesting thing that kind of came up out of nowhere and just kind of kept going. I actually really enjoyed it. Ten minutes on a, a Thursday afternoon having some some sort of banter about sport. And uh, I always knew it was a good one because as I was talking, my phone would start to go slightly crazy. <laughs> I must have said something ridiculous or uh, something. You sort of have... 30 text messages buzzing while you start trying to talk into your phone. It was pretty silly. But, yeah, that was a big shock. You know, those guys, I, I don't know them personally, but you sort of get used to spending time with them. And, and uh, look, I guess my, my heart really went out to them. It was just uh, such a sudden thing. I don't know what it was like for them, but um, that you sort of, one, you do the show one week, and then the next week, it's not just the show that doesn't exist. It's the, it's the entire station. So, I, uh, I'm sure, like you guys, have, it's a, a big part of my upbringing. Listen to radio sport and the banter and the and the thing. So, it'd be interesting to see whether the the phoenix rises from the ashes or, or what happens there. Yeah, pretty brutal. I, I work with radio sport. They're part of the under the NZME umbrella, obviously. So I know a lot of those guys really well. And it's yeah, it was a horrible, horrible week, and it's been a, a horrible fortnight really for the media industry. Um, mm -hmm. But if you are looking to retain some sort of regular sort of ask me anything spot. <laughs> whatever you do perhaps you know you could cater to our audience between two beers has a, a big following now on social media so maybe you can be our go-to guy who knows sure yeah anytime i won't be wearing the <laughs> headphones but uh, i've learned from my experience Fulch, one of the themes I like to ask guests, um, if they've been involved with the Football Ferns, I ask them about Andreas Heraf. If they've been involved with the All Whites, I ask them about Anthony Hudson <laughs> and what their relationship was with him because he's he's been quite a polarising figure. What were your experiences with Hudson? Oh, look, um, when, he was, when he was appointed, I was actually pretty pleased. I thought that he was the exact sort of guy that I would have appointed. So someone that was young... Um, you know, hungry for success because they they wanted they needed it for their career. Um, he sort of quote unquote looked like a, a modern coach, um, quite a sort of educationalist. So so when he was appointed, I, I was I was pretty happy. Um, went on one tour with him, um, it seemed pretty good, uh, and then <laughs> it all came pretty much crashing down after that. So he uh, he I think he he felt that I was maybe a, a negative influence. Um, I, I've always been someone that has uh, has spoken my own mind. So it, when I think about my practice um, and my professional relationships, I want people around me that are, you know, the, the sort of best people that I can find. So uh, and people that have skills that I don't have um, and so that we can achieve something better. And I, I just I sort of felt that he um, thought that I was um, – maybe a bit difficult i was very honest with him i sort of said these are the things that i think went went well um from the the previous regime with ricky these are the areas where i think things really were not so good um and these are the, some other opportunities for improvement and i was quite upfront about that um and he we had a meeting he said look do you want to keep going i said yeah i'm i'm keen to keep going um, and then uh, about a week later, I get a, a call from Fred, Fred de Jong. He's like, oh, um, I hear you're not going to be part of the team anymore. I was like, ah, uh, no, no. I, I sort of uh, I, I met with Anthony and we talked it through and I understand, you know, he, sort of where he's coming from and uh, I think we sorted it out. And he's like, oh, no, I need to call him again. So I, I maybe rang him half a dozen times. Um, and then randomly bumped into him up at the Millennium. And I said, look, what, what's going on? You know, you, you're dodging me. I thought that we, you know, we decided we were going to keep going. He's like, oh, no, I've, I've, uh, I've got someone else in. Um, so essentially, uh, I was fired uh, without actually being fired face to face. Um, it was a bit awkward because I was the, the medical director at New Zealand Football. So I was running the medical services at the organization and uh, was removed from the team. Um, which, which, I, look, it was very hard for me to to kind of uh, 
I, I don't know, without being a total dick about it, I just, I had to get on with the job that I had, which was running the medical services and um, empowering the new guy to do a better job. But I guess that for me really uh, colored my ongoing relationship with the man, the fact that he, he didn't talk to me face to face. Um, he didn't uh, kind of give me any real uh, explanation as to why he didn't didn't want me to keep going. He just, uh, just binned me. So so that was uh, that was my relationship with with him, which I would say was poor. Um, and then Andreas Saraf really uh, didn't have a lot to do with him. He came in, um, and really my main observation was he, he had a very fixed idea about what he wanted to achieve, um, and it had nothing to do with uh, I guess the New Zealand reality. So I don't, he really made no effort in my in my sub observations to kind of understand what the the New Zealand reality was, what things were going well in New Zealand, what things were not going well in New Zealand. Um, I, I just really think that he made zero effort to kind of integrate and retain things that were good. Um, he just came with his idea of what was good and tried to impose it. So did I see any bullying or anything like that? Nothing like that. I just didn't, I didn't see someone that was prepared to kind of engage in making New Zealand football better. I just saw someone with his own ideas that he just wanted to impose. And are you back inside the tent now? A relationship with Danny Hay? Are you? I know the All Whites haven't been on many tours, but will you be on the next one? No, look, I, I, I don't. I'm not really interested in going on tours anymore. So I, I, I think I've got a good relationship with Danny. I think I've got a good relationship with, uh, with most of the coaches at. Well, I think all of the coaches at, at New Zealand Football. Um, but, but as I said, I'm much more interested. I think in empowering others to do that role. Um, I'd rather be at home with my kids, ideally. Um, I'd rather kind of put my energy into things where there's, there's more of a reach. Um, I kind of see the players when they get injured. So often when they come back from tours, they'll come see, still see me. I still kind of am, am managing the players, still seeing the players, still have a relationship with a lot of the players. But um, I, don't, I don't see myself um, at this stage of my career going away on those tours. One tour that you did um, you did go on, you're actually part of uh, a quite historical moment in New Zealand football when our under-17s qualified for the knockout stages um, of the FIFA Under-17 World Cup in Nigeria in 2009. Again, um, a member of staff had, has indicated that perhaps you weren't as excited as some of the other staff members <laughs> were when Jack Hobson went to school to put New Zealand through. Um, what's your recollections of, of that tour and that experience? Well, um, I would say that on the whole, my reflections of that tour w were very, very positive. You know, I, on on paper, um, it's fair to say I wasn't that fired up about going to Nigeria. I had a lot of concerns from a health point of view about what what the tournament would look like, what was the security going to be like. Um, it just didn't. There was a yellow fever outbreak, as I recall. Um, it just oh, didn't seem like it. <laughs> yeah, they did. There was a big turnout. So, um, so I wasn't really that fired up for it. Um, I remember getting off the plane. We, we flew to a place called Inugu. I remember um, you get there, you've been traveling for 40 hours, 40 hours, you just want a hot shower. I remember turning the shower on, the water was brown, um, waiting for the water to not be brown. Water stayed brown, had shower in brown water. Um, then I remember drying myself off with a white towel which struck me as weird. Like, how do you have a, a white towel when the water is brown and when you dry yourself with white towel, it turns brown? One of life's big questions. Um, but then the, the tour was, it was, it was a great tour. The people were great. The, uh, the, the games were ridiculous. The first game we played, I think, was against Ivory Coast. Um, we absolutely got battered in the first half. It was about 1,000 degrees. Um, then at halftime, we went in and it was like someone had flicked a switch because it was suddenly freezing and monsoon rains to the point that the, the turf, which had only just been laid, lifted up. So there were like bubbles of turf about two feet high. Um, the manager went around and popped them all with his pen knife. Um, and after a suspension, we went out and played in like Kiwi conditions and we pumped them and ended up one all. Um, then we played, I can't remember the second game, third game we're playing Turkey. Um, there've been lots of banter with the Turkey, uh, staff in the, in the, um, in the hotel. We got on really well with them and 
like a, they they put out a second string team basically and uh, sitting on the bench i remember sitting next to adam crump possibly your source uh thinking um we're, what, what are we going to do in a sort of 16 hour layover which classic new zealand football at that time booking <laughs> Um, you might have organized it, I think, Seamus. Um, <laughs> we're sitting there, what are we going to do in Dubai, uh, talking about this and that, we're going to go here and do this, and then suddenly Jack Hobson McVay just smashes one in, like proper worldy. <laughs> and um, I dispute that I wasn't happy about that. I'm sure that there might have been a, a bit of uh, banter on, online about how Crumpy and I were cuddling each other and just carrying on in the sideline. But it did, uh, it did change our travel plans, and then we went to, I think we went to Abuja, Okay. Um, and and we played Nigeria in the national stadium, so we got badly beaten. But it was again one of those great experiences. You know, there's probably forty or fifty thousand people in the stadium, um, all just mad, mad Nigeria fans. So um, yeah, it was it's definitely uh, it <laughs> it was it was changed the plans, but they, it wasn't in a bad way. Fulch, I'm going to um, ask a fairly self-indulgent question here, but I feel like 90 minutes in, if people have made it this far, uh, they're in it for the for the long haul. <laughs> um, when you, you saw me at some of my worst points with, with regards to my back issues, injuries, and I came up to see you in your clinic in Auckland, and I think we had a, a few beers by the casino once, and I was trying to get some sort of uh, rough advice. Um I've credited, I've spoken a, a bit about this on the podcast, I've credited breathing with being one of the things that basically turned the whole ship around. I mean, I'm, I feel almost like new again now. We were close at one point. I mean, you, you referred me to surgeons. We were looking at sort of a fusion of the spine. There was all this sort of stuff going on. Is it surprising to you that breathing might have been the answer or is it more likely that it kind of was just going to sort itself out anyway, and over time it just settled down. Look, I, I think the first thing is that I, um, I I keep a really open mind about lots of different treatments. So there's not one thing that I would say, do not try this, do not try that. So um, I, as I recall, our conversation was around um, that I didn't see any reason why you should stop doing things. I was quite keen for you to be out there trying to run um, I think the problem for people who've had an injury for a while is that they often get in a bit of a rut um, and then the pain becomes um, quite overwhelming. So that's the the main thing. And sometimes the pain doesn't really have a lot to do with the original problem. So yes, you've got a disc in your back that ain't so good or some cartilage in your knee that's not so good. Um, but your body then um, has a tough time not listening to that pain. So I'm not sure if I've explained that very well, but there's the, the, the structural problem that started it all off and then it becomes a secondary pain problem. Um, and for most of my patients, I'm trying to encourage them to kind of get on with it a bit and try and find ways of being active. That's fundamentally the way that I treat most of these problems. And so, look, the breathing and the, the, the showers in the morning, like I, I don't know what exactly that is doing. But I think some of those things are helping get those pain pathways under control. Um, and there's lots of different ways to do that. So for some people, acupuncture is, is quite important. For some people, it's an injection. For some people, it's some medication. Uh, for some people, it's some breathing and cold showers. So look, I think what I encourage everyone to do is to, if, if they think things like that might work, it's to give it a try um, and, and to see what they think. And if they think it helps, then pursue it. If they think it doesn't help, then stop and find something else. Just needed to that's fix worse. my head, wasn't that's it? Worse. Just, it's all, it's all well, in there. Do you know, that's that's what patients hear. So I, it is absolutely not a head problem. So there's some quite interesting medical shit that we could talk about where if people have got pain for a while, you can kind of measure the impact that that pain has on their nervous system. So you can measure the way that reflexes work, for for example. So... I remember reading one study that was if you had some chronic pain in your left elbow, it affected the, the reflexes and the rest of your body. So it's not about it being your brain or being a conscious thing. It's a, a physiological um, or inbuilt phenomenon that just it happens when you've been in pain for a while. So it's like your nerves all become totally upregulated. So what I think might have happened with, uh, with the breathing for you, Stephen, is that it's just allowed some of those kind of upregulated processes, the things where basically you're getting amplified pain response, 
it's allowed those things to kind of come back under check. Um, the other thing is that as you become more physically capable, so for some people they get, you know, they're overweight, for other people they become really deconditioned, the muscles don't work very well. Um, as you become reconditioned and as you can do more, then you have less pain as well. So you're kind of approaching the problem from, from multiple different angles. And so for, for me, the advice that you got, you know, stop running, don't do anything, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. So if you stop doing anything, you become more deconditioned. You stop doing anything, you become real grumpy and pissed off. Um, it affects the way that you sleep, the way that you um, feel about life. That all amplifies more pain. So um, I, th I think, you know, whatever it is, if you can find something to commit to that seems to work for you, whatever that may be, then you're probably starting to treat your problem to some extent. Like that answer. Shay, we're uh, sort of getting towards the end. Uh, how's our list looking? We, we tick most of the stuff off? Yeah, we, we, we have. Let's just go um, island hopping for a second. So we spoke about um, you starting your your um, football career in, um, in Samoa with the New Zealand teams, but you actually had a stint playing football in the Cook Islands as well as working. Um, <laughs> when was that and how did that come about, Fulch? Uh, that was around about 2001. Um, so th there's a thing you can do when you're at, in your last year of medical school where you can go and uh, spend three months getting a different experience. So some people go to Harvard, some people go to Stanford or Yale. I went to Rarotonga um, uh, for half of it um, and worked at the hospital there, which was just, it was a great experience. Um, and one of the things that made it such a good experience was getting to know uh, a whole bunch of guys from Rarotonga, and another great example of you know football opening some doors. Um, I played for the Mighty Tupapa, uh, who are one of the better teams in Rarotonga, and uh, I I didn't live in Tupapa, so what happened was I arrived. Um, I got on the phone to the Cook Islands Football Association. So look, I've just got here. I'm wondering if I can play football, and they're like, "Oh, no, you can't. You can't really do that." And I was like, "You know." I'm really keen. You know, I play football in New Zealand. I, I've heard the season's on. I'm, I'm pretty keen to play. And they're like, oh, who have you played for? And I said, oh, um, I've just been playing for North Shore. Um, and he's like, oh, uh, what team? I was like, in the first team, I was playing for National League in, in uh, North Shore. And he's like, oh, you need to play for Tupapa. I was like, no, oh, I live in Tetakavaka. And he's like, no, they don't have a team this year. And then I was like, oh, I think the next team around is – Nikau or something and they're like oh no they don't have a team either <laughs> and so somewhat naively I showed up at Tupapa signed on for Tupapa only to find that my village did have a team and uh, was short of players which <laughs> was another thing uh, and the next one around Matavera had a team uh, but I played for Tupapa and look it was it was really fun so um, enjoyed well, I don't know what I did played 10 games in the, the Cook Islands National League nice nice um we, I missed the opportunity to ask you about it when we were talking FIFA as well, Fulch, but um, at the Club World Cup, you were part of an initiative which I think had a second doctor in the stands watching a TV monitor. Was that specifically around um, like head injury and sudden cardiac arrest or what, what um, was that? Yeah, so that was this year just gone. So um, one of life's great hardships was to have to go to the Club World Cup and watch my team Liverpool play twice, which... Um, Tough which was gig. quite good. Yeah, tough gig. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the idea, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do around um, concussion, but also any kind of more significant injury is one of, the, one of the problems is that the team doctor is the one making the decisions, but often the team doctor hasn't actually seen what's happened or the immediate aftermath of that. So if the player's been knocked unconscious, sometimes by the time you get out there, um, they actually kind of look okay. Um, sometimes... Um, you know, someone's knee injury looks horrendous on TV, but actually when you physically get there, it may not look that bad. So the idea there was to try and provide a bit of feedback to the team doctor. So um, at the games, there'd be two FIFA doctors. One would sit on the sideline, access to a tablet and um, wide up, uh, one in the stand. And so if there was something that looked more significant, we could walk the tablet over to the team doctor or the medical staff and let them see the injury mechanism and, and what had happened. So... Um, I think that that is, um, it, well, it's something that's been around in rugby league uh, 
for quite a while. Um, and I think it's something that we can definitely learn from other sporting codes and, and do a better job in football. And then, um, again, FIFA-wise, you mentioned the, the FIFA Medical Committee that you've been on. Um, you've also um, had a hand in, in recording a number of injury prevention videos over the years. Do you ever look back at those videos and wish that you had the hair that you had when you recorded those way back when? <laughs> um, well, um, do you know, I, I, I've i moved on from here, I think. You know, like I've got a, I've got a wife I love, uh, I've got kids. Um, really, the only the only real problem with hair, or the, the issue I have with hair is, is sunburn. So um, this is one of the few occasions I'm not wearing a cap. I don't think it would be professional to be uh, in this sort of medium wearing a cap, but um, it's just me. Um, <laughs> so, you have uh, head prop, though, so it's, it's yeah, a well, head that's prop right. that you've, you've elected. Yeah, for, if, anything, I think it, if anything, yeah. I think it's drawing attention to my bald head, but um, <laughs> yeah. It looks great. I think when we start talking here, it might be time to wrap <laughs> things up. Um, Fulch, thank you so much for, I know your time is very valuable. So uh, an hour 45 on a um, Sunday night is very much appreciated. Um, thanks so much. You've, you've had a, obviously great experiences. And uh, Shay, how do you think that one went? Uh, no, that was excellent. Fulch has been a, a very good friend for a number of years. So I'm glad that we got him on, on um, and wrote out some of those te technical technology issues that we had through the podcast. Hopefully people have stuck around for that one hour 45. So thanks very much, Fulch. Yeah. Cheers, Fulch. Appreciate your time. Absolute pleasure, guys. Uh, keep up the good work. Thanks, mate. And